becoming proficient at calculating osmolarity. And this section I shamelessly stole from Dr. Bill Schrader. I believe he's here. I think he might be lecturing. Um, and so th these, that's him. This is him that, was, that I've stolen. Uh, I, and, and the eyes in here are his eyes, not me. Uh, this is him, Dr. Schrader. I can't tell you how many patients we see who have virtually no veins because of multiple previous IVs which have been given in normal saline with hypertonic nutrients rather than sterile water for infusion. This is because, I'm reading off page 46. This is because osmolarity has not been calculated and or nutrients have just been dumped into an IV or medication added in hospital solutions. In many cases, nutrients or drugs were just added to normal saline without regard to osmolarity. This is especially a problem with vitamin C and magnesium as they have a very high osmolarity. Uh, now, to go back to where, we, where this section starts on page 40, it kind of says the same thing there at the, at the very beginning. Um, and osmolarity and osmolality, they sound uh, similarly close. And I, I understand it, but I don't know that I do a good job of explaining it. And so uh, if someone's really good at explaining it, please stand up and do so. Uh, the... Um, this gets into the basic chemistry and stoic stoichiometry, uh, <clears throat> and the um, osmolality is a term of concentration, whereas osmolarity is a term of pressure, if you will. And if you take any of our red blood cells and drop it into a cylinder of water, Water likes to have the same concentration everywhere. And so the water will seep into the red blood cell and the red blood cell will lice or explode. That's not good. Because it, you know, you gotta, it takes a little bit for the bone marrow to make a, a red blood cell. And so uh, you don't want to put in a solution that is hypoosmolar. Now, uh, at the top of page 41, this might be a better place to start, the normal osmolarity of our plasma is somewhere between 0.28 and, or 2, 0.280 and, and 0.310. That's milliosmoles per milliliter. And if you convert it to milliosmoles per liter, then it's 280 and 310. Y'all understand what we did there? Instead of because it's interesting, he says, for our, our purposes, I'll always talk in terms of milliosmoles per milliliter, but then right down below it, he's talking about milliosmoles per liter. In other words, if you've got a large vein and you're going to do a push, you, want, you can get away with a 1,400 um, osmolarity. Medium vein, 950. Any vein, 400. And then if you do an IV, a slow drip, 1,200 um, is your osmolarity for a large one, 700 and 400 once again. And so, you kind of say, gee, if the safest place to be is probably a little bit closer to 400 for all, all comers to protect the veins. And it's important because if you've got someone that's coming in and they're going to do 40 IVs, you want to protect those veins. And so, those are some really important numbers to remember there and in terms of what you want to do, because you don't want to put in a solution that is under that because you will cause the red blood cells to lice, cause hemolysis. And it's, it's easier for the body to rehydrate a red blood cell than to go have to make a whole new one. Then you get to all, got all the uh, hemolysis hitting the kidneys and all that kind of good stuff, just not good. And so... Bill does a really good job of going through all this, but he'll take his lecture is usually a couple of three hours, and so I'm not even going to try to pretend to to go through it. But on on page 49, he lists there the osmolarity of. Uh, pretty much most of the things we're going to be putting into an IV. 
And so, it's, in other words, it's don't just add things because you think it's a good, I, good idea because you might end up hurting someone. And so, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that Dr. Myers did, figuring up the, the dosages for the Myers cocktail. And if, you know, if you want to make up your own IV, figure out the osmolarity of your contents and make sure that you're in bounds and you're not, like I said, you're not going to hurt someone. And you've got these different equations here and he goes through how to figure out what the osmolarity is, how much uh, water do, do I need to add, half normal saline, and calculate it out. And he gives several different examples. Uh, and he does a, a, on page 45, does an IV of vitamin C, but adds some other things into it and <clears throat> goes through how, the, how he calculates how much water to add to it. Then you'd have to look at the, see what the um, osmolarity is. And now we've got the convenience of having our, our wonderful cell phone, so we can, <laughs> you know, I would imagine we get the osmolarity just about anything. And I believe I forgot to include this, but th this is from the, the, and this is what they're, probably what they're using intact. Uh, this is a standard EDTA formula and calculated the osmolarity of the formula, or of the, and in our office, uh, we have a, an IV protocol book and try to keep it updated. Um, and so it just, it's a recipe. It's a, like a cookbook, if you will, but keeps everybody on the same page. Um, so if you know what you're doing, you're doing the, doing the same thing all the time. <clears throat> You guys out, didn't I? Thank you. And then over on page uh, 52, and I didn't, I didn't write 52 on there because I didn't know if you were going to copy it. You wouldn't want 52 written sitting on it, so I didn't number that page. But these are some of the protocols that Dr. Schrader uses in his office. And then on page 53, um, he developed most of these protocols. He didn't develop the Myers uh, cocktail. Um, and I'm almost positive that he has a book. Uh, Dr. Schrader has a book out that has a lot of different um, information in it about some of these different protocols because things get really kind of interesting over there on page 54 where he starts going into different protocols that you can use in your office.
kind of a neat gold mine of IVs and IV information, isn't it? And I was asked where we get our supplies from. I kind of don't know. My nurse does the ordering and my practice manager oversees it. And uh, we've got the protocols in place. And so I don't really, I know that we get our IV vitamin C from McGuff because they have corn free, preservative free. Um, and so... And also, some of our, our, our local compounders will make up some <clears throat> some of the, the additives we use. And some folks will use uh, uh, the compounders to make up the IV, make up the whole thing for them. They don't make up anything in their own offices. And I'm not certain, as, uh, anybody know what the regulations are in terms of, of making up your own solutions in your office? I think so you're supposed to have a hook. Yes, sir. Could y'all hear the, there was a, I, I don't remember how many years ago it was that uh, Massachusetts, was it, the, uh, no, New England, the New England compounding pharmacy uh, put out a whole bunch of contaminated uh, steroid injections and killed a few people and the FDA um, use that opportunity to make life incredibly difficult for compounders as well as practitioners. And if, like you just said, if you, if you make up an IV and you add more than five things, you're considered a compounding pharmacist, not a doctor. I mean, a, you know, this is another reason we need to have state medical societies to say, no, that's, this is wrong. Uh, just use sterile technique and, you know, let us go. So, um, Proceed with caution. Um, and at the very end, I put in, these are all, these are urine challenge tests of mine. Because um, in my clinic, I'll tell, since the patients are paying cash for them, I say, look, you can, we'll do this test whenever, however many times you want. However, and I'll show this to them, I say, if you're looking to see a significant change, it's probably not going to be there. And because the hard thing to remember is, is that this, the urine challenge test, these results just show what comes out. It doesn't tell you how much you've got in your body. We can't give that answer. I don't know of any way to do that other than the multiple biopsy, um, you know, procedures. Now, the, on page 68, there on, uh, between 1998 and 2011, I'd done about 60 chelations of EDTA, and with 20 of them, I did DMPS. And I was kind of surprised that that much came out. I was like, whoa, what? Yeah. And so in December of that year, I rechecked it thinking, no, that can't be. And silly me, they're still coming out. And, oh, and by, by December, I'd done about 80 uh, chelations. Uh, and then on page 69, took a little break there from doing Doctor's Dad in 2014. Ah, maybe they are coming down. Yeah, stuff's working. I'm not, I'm not peeing out as much. And then that just got shattered by the test there on 2015. Oops, just kidding. There they are coming out again. And uh, the, then on the very back page is from 2016. And I was hoping I have, would have 2017 back by now, but I don't. So it's in the, 
that doctor's data in the oven right now. So it's been estimated that one would have to chelate um, on a very regular basis for at least 15 years in order to kind of get to where you're not going to be having much coming out. Why'd I do this? Yeah. Why not? Did you have any symptoms like bloody or Had no clue, felt no difference. Now, um, I, I just gave you an example of the blood pressure. You know, we're taught that 95% of the blood pressure is idiopathic. You know, horse feathers. You know, if you have, do you have blood pressure when you were 10 years old? No. I mean, 20, no. Okay, so, you know, something has been added to the equation. And so I didn't have high blood pressure, thank goodness, you know, knock on wood. But that's that's one of the things, if someone has high blood pressure, you know, they don't have a procardia deficiency or a, you know, whatever. And so, and like I said, with the, with the ladies, it's a really good idea to, you know, say, hey, there's a good, good chance you got metal. And the problems with the metals is they, they mess up the enzymes. They just screw up our metabolism, and, it, and it's never in our favor <laughs> that they do this. It'd be nice if we get exposed to a metal and become smarter or stronger or faster or something, but it just doesn't work out that way. I think it's a different methodology. <clears throat> Is there anything we need to review, go over, talk? I mean, talk about, explain? And like I said, give us your feedback. What needs to be changed? What, what can we do to make this better for the next group? And also feedback on which form did you like? I mean, and it doesn't matter to me. I mean, they're both on the computer, so it's, you know, do I push this button or that button in terms of reproducing it? So it's not like it's a, you know, so, I mean, any, any kind of feedback would be more than welcomed. Her question was about chelating out, alum chelating out aluminum, and EDTA will do it. Well, the N-acetylcysteine doesn't, well, the, you, we take the N-acetylcysteine, so our bodies will up the production of glutathione, and glutathione activates the enzymes to get the metals out, and I think it's pretty much all of them. Glutathione is good stuff. She was asking about the liposomal liposomal glutathione. I really don't know. So um, the liposomal stuff is really interesting um, in terms of the vitamin C, B12, um, alpha lipoic acid. They've put a lot of things liposomal them. And are they that much better? I honestly don't know. Of course, they swear they are. Okay. Well, I mean, and I've looked to folks that have had experience with it to say, oh, yeah, this one's better. I like, you know, I've had this result. Has anybody had any results or 
anything to say about the liposomal concoctions? Huh? They're expensive. Yeah, I mean. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I don't know if the liposomal, I don't know if it's hype or if it's actually that good. Anything else? Heck, let's go eat lunch. <laughs>